everyone. Um, my name is Peter. I'm here to represent uh, my colleagues both at JPL and at Goddard and at NASA Ames. Um, as Cynthia mentioned in her introduction, for this particular mission opportunity, the, it's really important. For, if we're going to succeed in, in, in this endeavor, we really need to have integrated payloads that really work well together. So we actually took upon ourselves before the IC2 call to actually begin that process of integrating together what we believe is the most powerful instrument suite for addressing the organic compositional measurements that are detailed in the science definition team report. So I'm going to talk today, I'm going to give you a motivation for how that process went, and then I'm going to tell you a focus on the stuff that we've done at JPL. And uh, here you've probably, if you're in this session, presumably you've looked at this before, but you can, um, you can think of the, the organic chemical measurements as, as this means for looking at biosignatures and in, in ordered structures. And the report really prioritizes the first two and deprioritizes isotopic measurements because you can get false positives in that way. So right away, Emily Suite was designed to really focus on these two things. And I'm going to make some very simple points that, that may be self-evident, but maybe not. So the first thing, th this idea of looking for um, biosignatures embedded in populations. So again, you can only identify these things if you look at an aggregate sum of a, a population of things and then compare one thing with respect to another. So the sort of canonical distribution or the mention of this came a long time ago. Love Glock wrote about this. It's not new, and he always shows this distribution of alkanes, abiotic ones on the top, biotic ones on the bottom. And again, if you just measured any one of those, you wouldn't be able to identify this biosignature. Another example you've heard much about, I'm sure, is amino acids. So again, there's, all, there's other distributions of amino acids. Not, if you just measure them, it doesn't tell you really anything whether or not there's a biosignature. But there's these three different ones, what types are present, their relative abundances, and of course their chirality. So if you're going to measure those distributions, you need to do separation science. That's the first, first take-home measure. If you really want to address the science in the best possible way written in the Oakland report, you have to do this thing where you take a sample, you separate it apart, and then you do these type of analyses. So, so you can do that if you take the sample. There's, you can't use solids because things are locked in place in the solid, but you get to pick liquids, gases, or subcritical fluids and if you want to do that. So that's an intrinsic thing that's part of the MLA suite. Second, if you want to look for complexity, the second type of complexity, the complexity that's embedded in an individual molecule, here's some examples of ones on Earth. We don't want to be limited to just look at molecules we know exist in Earth and terrestrial biology. So you want to look at things like this, and other complex ones. The only really, truly general purpose method to do that is mass spectrometry. So right away, to first order, you have to do those, both of those things have to be included in your suite. Finally, important point, this, they have to be very, very sensitive. So the, the, the measurement requirements here, you know, you, you, you got to be able to detect amino acids in, in water floating around the uh, Earth's South Pole, or you shouldn't, you shouldn't try this on another world, especially not Europe. So it needs to be a very sensitive way to, to, to transfer your molecules into your detector system. And then another thing that you can kind of get lost if you just read the requirements like that is you really need to do this with a whole bunch of different molecules that are actually quite different. And the differences between those molecules really inform how you build the instrument. So of course, we're look, going, going to an ocean world, it's got water, but the, the, so because things can dissolve in water, but not everything dissolves in water. If I go jump in a swimming pool, I don't dissolve completely and disappear. There's parts of me that are not dissolvable in water, and they're also very interesting. And those things, of course, are described in the ladder of life detection. It'll be a really interesting uh, rollout this evening that we sh I, I encourage you all to attend. I'm really looking forward to myself. And there, there's a variety of different ways that you can, you can represent all these different the types of molecules and their information content. So to first order, then let, you get these four things. You know, you, if you want to do this right, you've got to have, analyze a whole bunch of different molecules with different properties. You've got to do separation science on multiple fluid phases. You've got to do mass spec, and it has to be really sensitive. So let's talk about now, let's, you're going to pick something. So here's the way that we've come up of, of representing all the different sort of molecular animals in this zoo, okay? You can, we, we've chosen these two axes. It gives a nice scatter plot of different properties and, and all of the things you find in the ladder of life. The axes you see on the bottom here in the x-axis is solubility in water. So things insoluble on the left, highly soluble on the right. On your y-axis, you see heat of vaporization. That's how much energy you have to put into the system to cause it to vaporize. And if you want to probe that really well, so we went, there's a lot of instrument concepts being worked at at JPL and at Goddard and at Ames, and we had all kinds of things to consider. 
and we just wanted to maximize the coverage. So what we wanted to do, first of all, this is a very risky mission. We're gonna choose the most mature techniques that can address and do the maximum coverage of this phase space. So if you're gonna use a gas phase thing, you, your molecules that you're gonna put on here, they have to survive that heat. You gotta get them in the gas phase without destroying them. So this is where we've chosen the techniques. If, if you went to Jen Eigenbrode's planet, uh, the plenary uh, session this morning, these are the techniques that were used to discover all the organic molecules she talked about on Mars. Okay, these, these are, this is the core part of the instrument with the same people building the same heritage hardware to deliver that science. If you want to analyze things as a liquid, the other stuff here that's extremely interesting, of course, then you have to be able to dissolve these things in a liquid and you do separation science that way. So we've selected these other techniques to address all these different things and we're going to do liquid-based separation science with a bunch of different detectors, which I'm gonna tell you about in a moment. So we choose the highest TRL hardware with the lowest development risk. risk. There's obviously things that are super exciting, that it's, but it's really hard to imagine actually implementing them on a mission, and they have to be able to achieve the science. So NASA Goddard is gonna be delivering the mass spectrometry and most critically, the mission experience. These are the people that have actually done separation science and discovered organics on other planetary surfaces. Here, at, at our team at JPL is going to do the liquid extraction, so taking the sample, getting into the liquid phase from whatever mineral or liquid is present, and then doing the separation science and detection. And NASA Ames has the, the only entity that's done spaceflight microfluidics, so they're going to deliver that portion. And of course, Honeybee Robotics is involved in on all parts of that. Um, so you put this whole thing together, we call it EMILY. Will gave a poster. Will is the PI of um, an IC2 project on this topic. He gave a poster last night and, and describing the whole thing. And if you, you can speak with him, uh, if you can find him after this. Here's just a quick representation of the different techniques. I'm not going to go into detail. I already kind of told you what the, the different things we've chosen are. I'll tell you a little bit about the liquid stuff now. So um, the oceans component uses electrophoresis. This is really if you just use Occam's razor and you're like, okay, I accept, Peter, I accept the fact you're going to have to do this separation science on liquids, how are we going to do it? The very simplest thing, the way you can do it is to use electrophoresis. You just, you basically rely upon the fact that in a little hollow glass tube, if you apply voltages, things move at different speeds. It's the minimum number of elements. It looks like a fiber optic cable and, and all the pieces are all space flight compatible. You can, you can build this stuff. It's the, the additional benefit, of course, it has all these things that are you want for a spaceflight mission, in, in, including the sensitivity and, and efficiency. And it works, as I said, by different things move at different speeds. And then the beauty, of course, is you can couple it to these different detectors. And the different detectors were the different regions in that phase space. So there's different ones that are better for different things. So I'm going to go into a little bit of detail, tell you some things um, that have happened at GPL that enabled us to get to the place we are now to, to you know, credibly propose to do this. Um, I hope that many of you were able to attend Jessica Creamer's talk. On Tuesday, she described how at JPL we've pushed the envelope and now have developed the most capable method for doing this amino acid analysis on spaceflight missions. And her work, of course, was designed to simultaneously make measurements of all different types of amino acids and different chiralities and to do it in a really sensitive way. And the take home message is all amino acids are different and if you want to analyze them all, you really have to do a lot of work to tease them all apart. And since the time of the publication that you see here, she's actually pushed the limited detection down to one nanomolar for most of the species. So we meet all the requirements for amino acids. Um, let's talk about hardware. So we, we, of course, we have a whole bunch of different variants on how we do this at JPL. We design them so that they're plug and play, so that the interfaces are straightforward between all of them. But generally speaking, you, you gotta be able to take some piece of uh, a sample and put it in, convert it to a liquid, and then manipulate it and do the separation and detection. So if you attended the talks on Tuesday, you would have seen about the microchip branch. So Fernando Mora has brought the chemical laptop instrument to this really high level of fidelity now where we can just simply add a sample, a liquid sample to this unit and press start and it will completely in an automated sense run and perform these type of analyses. Florian Kale has developed this portable extractor which works in a similar way. If you can deliver some dirt to the top of the instrument and you can press start, it will in an automated way completely do the, the extraction so you can actually liberate biomolecules from the samples and then of course you can just feed the extractor directly into the analyzer without doing any other tricks. You don't need to desalt, you don't need to concentrate, 
you don't need to do any, there's no hidden behind the curtain stuff that happens. It just passes it straight in. So here you can see a trace on the, the upper left. That's what, what the data looks like when you perform this on this material that's sitting on these driest, deadest of hills in the Atacama Desert. And you can see all these different little peaks there are actually different amino acids, and we're able to do, make chiral measurements of alanine, leucine, and valine at this subparts per billion level. So that's a big deal. So the next thing we're going to do in September is we're going to take both of them and mount them together on the AREDS rover, the, the KREX rover, and we're going to do this in a <coughs> completely automated sense. So I, I couldn't resist saying this. I'm sure you guys, many of you have seen these talks over the years. This is, if you are familiar at all with the URI instrument, this is really the first time we will ever have demonstrated this end-to-end -end validation of, the, of a, a URI-like experiment, which is super old. You know, Jeff Beta started talking about this in the 90s. These ideas were new over a decade ago. There was a brief time when we were actually contemplated for inclusion on the uh, ExoMars payload, and now we're finally making that dream true. We're finally doing the things that we should have been able to accomplish a decade or so ago. So, so we take all that information and it informs us, okay, what are we going to do on a Europa mission? And what we, we've decided, you know, we've we got to pick one of these two branches, and what we have decided is we need to pick this branch, the branch where we use hollow glass capillaries and not microchips. And the reason for that is this is the way to couple to mass spectrometry. So we ha as a, for reasons I mentioned before, you really need to do that. In, in, particularly think in terms of agnostic biosignatures. You want to discover unknown unknowns that dissolve in water. This is the way you're going to do it. So the real hard part then is trying to couple your separation into a mass spectrometry. That's the real missing piece of the puzzle. And for that, we've partnered with the one commercial vendor, SciX Corporation, it used to be Beckman Coulter. They're the one entity that's, that's managed to actually commercialize and make this incredibly delicate and challenging piece of hardware. So here's some data that you can see. They're, they have these little sprayers, and the beauty is that little sprayer is actually integrated directly into our glass capillary. It is part of the capillary. So it just, you use that and you just spray directly into a mass spectrometer and you can see some data here. This is amino acids and peptides and nucleotides and nucleobases. You put together the ocean suite, you have something that looks like this. You've got your fluid comes in, you've got the capillary, and then all these three detectors can be used. They can assay the same stuff flowing down the tube. Um, we realized that was the way to go. Constantine started as a postdoc and actually built this. This is an incredibly, uh, this is an unbelievable achievement as a postdoc to do this in such a short time. So we now have a brand new element, a new, tech, a new instrument actually that, that can achieve this and um, isolate the high voltages and eject samples. We, here's some data. You can see it's highly reproducible. This is using the system and calibrating it doing conductivity measurements. That's a, what the data looks like in the green bars. This is how reproducible. So we can just set it up and just run it over and over and over and over again. And it, it works the same each time. Um, we've now taken that as well and sprayed it into a mass spectrometer. We got a little portable system that, so we can mount the whole thing together. And it's you know, something you can carry. And here's a, the first demonstration where you can see all these different amino acids. I think I have a minute and a half. Um, and uh, no, okay. We plot th this is that you can overlay all this onto the Europa Lander science trace uh, uh, traceability. We basically hit all of the different things. We're we're doing all all this work that we're I'm describing here. We're doing it with TRL advancement in mind. We're actually doing the way that the flight system development should be done. We've had a few posters on that, and and we've also studied the, so the weakest elements with respect to radiation show that they tolerate that. We're using this in field work, not just in the Atacama Desert. Um, uh, and then as a parting message, I just want to say that, you know, we, this, Emily is intended to maximize the science return of a Europa lander mission and the chances of identifying life it's, if it's there. And we're doing this the right way. We're using flight project practices all the way at the early stages of the development. As I said, we've already got, undergone this process of integration. And the guiding principle, we're making these decisions now that we've decided what we're going to do is to minimize risk. And we take that into account every day when we show up to work. So I thank you very much for your time. There's, uh, we've got a whole bunch of presentations. There's a lot of people from JPL here. Please come talk to any of us if you have any additional questions.